We've just been looking at stars as black bodies and talking about this effect right here that as something is hotter, its peak intensity goes up, but also its peak wavelength sort of goes to lower value, so bluer, so to speak. And we can use this, and in fact we can use this, it's called Wien's Displacement Law, and this is actually going to really help us out. Now we actually have an equation for this, and it says this, that lambda max, in other words, that peak wavelength, and when we look at this drawing, it actually all comes from this drawing right here. So the wavelength, in this case right here, this is the wavelength for this cooler one here, this red one. The wavelength uh, where it has a peak intensity, that's the peak wavelength, so to speak. So that's the wavelength associated with the one that has the peak intensity. Whereas this blue one, its peak wavelength is over here. So we call this lambda max over here. And over here, this would be this one's lambda max. So we're going to find as lambda max equals... And here we have, uh, this is empirical, it's got a number, so 2.9 times 10 to the 3 divided by t. And this is Wien's displacement law. So maybe we should define everything here. So lambda max equals, uh, we'll say this is the maximum uh, wavelength. Well, actually better than that, I should say the wavelength associated with the maximum intensity. That's by more accurate. So the wavelength associated with the maximum intensity. And that's going to be measured in meters normally. And if we measure that in meters, well, we have this, it's called the, now T is going to be called the, uh, well, it's actually defined as the equivalent um, black body temperature and that's measured in degrees Kelvin temperature which is measured in Kelvin um, but we call it we call it the surface temperature so with a star for example we would call it a surface temperature. And that's because inside a star, you might actually have other things going on. Now see, what's really happening then is we say, okay, well then, if we look back over here, we have a certain temperature that gives you this sort of curve. So a certain temperature curve gives you this particular peak wavelength, whereas another temperature gives you a different peak wavelength. So you can see that this temperature here, hotter versus cooler, is associated with the wavelength. And so that means that we can relate the wavelength and the temperature. But now this is the temperature that a black body would have. In other words, if, if something was a perfect black body, that temperature there that you would put in, that you would heat that black body to, that would give you that exact lambda max, that exact maximum wavelength associated with the maximum intensity. But if we're looking at a star, um, of course, we're only seeing the light being emitted from the edge of the star, or sort of from the, the end of the star, you know, the, the star that's, you know, the part of the star that's closest to us, which means inside the star, there might be very different processes at work. So that's why we sort of, we carefully define it as surface temperature of a star. And that's because we can't necessarily say what goes on inside it. And in fact, even when we say surface temperature, that's also a bit dodgy because there's all sorts of different parts of a star. So for example, our sun, we have something called the photosphere and the chromosphere. We have all these different regions. And they have different temperatures. But when we just talk about a temperature of a star, we're going to mean the temperature that is associated with a black body that tells you that maximum. Now, why in the world would we ever use this? I thought that's important to say, so sort of, why is this useful? Well, we assume that stars are black bodies. That's the first sort of assumption. And by the way, this actually works fairly well. So this is actually not that bad of an assumption to make. So we assume that stars are black bodies. What we do then is, uh, I'll say so, if we measure the spectrum of a star, now how do we actually do that? We actually take the star's light and we break it up into its uh, component wavelengths. In other words, you put it through like a prism, for example, or a, some sort of diffraction grating. But if we take this star and we measure the, the spectrum, okay, so, we, so if we measure the spectrum of a star's light, 
um, then what we can do is we can tell its max wavelength. So if we actually take the spectrum, we can tell its maximum wavelength. So in other words, if we do the spectrum, we can actually measure this lambda max. And therefore, know its temperature. Now when we say this right here, we're going to be very careful. We're going to, we're going to call it its surface temperature. We're going to be careful here. Its surface temperature. In other words, its equivalent black body temperature. That's really awesome. So that means if we see stars that appear sort of redder, right? if that lambda max is redder, that tells us something about its temperature. It's fairly low. If we see a star that appears bluer or whiter, then we know its temperature is higher. So that's really useful, I think. So that's how we deal with this Wien's displacement law. Now we have another law, and that one is actually called the Stefan Boltzmann's law. Now this one uh, goes like this. It says L equals, uh, it's normally written as this, uh, this little sigma a t to the power of 4. That's this one right here. So maybe we should define some of these things. So L is the luminosity. That we've learned before. That's the luminosity of a star which is measured in watts, or it could be measured in joules per second. Now this sigma, that's a Greek lowercase sort of s. Uh, one of my students actually called it whistle. They thought it looked like a little whistle. I'm not sure about that, but we call it the Stefan Boltzmann constant. So this is Stefan Boltzmann. So we call it the Stefan Boltzmann constant. And actually we just, it's just got a value. So we actually know that sigma equals, I kind of like this one because it goes 5.67 times 10 to negative 8. I like that. It's like 5, 6, 7, 8, kind of. Uh, but it's measured in uh, watts per meter squared, and what else would it have? It would have a Kelvin to the minus 4. In other words, it's watts per meter squared per Kelvin to the power of 4. This isn't necessarily something to memorize, though. Just look it up if you need it. So there's sigma. Now A, this is important, this is the surface area. So this could be surface area of a star, for example. Um, but this could also be the surface area that you're sort of emitting over. But uh, normally we write it as a surface area of a star. Now that's measured in meters squared. But it's important to understand how surface area of a sphere works. We learned this before, that the surface area of a sphere equals 4 pi r squared. That's what it is. So it's important to know then that A contains sort of this this term right here. So if ever you're looking at A here, this surface area of the star, uh, then we have to know that we're talking about 4 pi r squared. In other words, we know something about the radius of the star. We can actually use this later on to do some really neat things as well to tell something about the distance away. And there then we talk about the surface area of this shell. But in this case, we're going to talk about stars. Of course, then T is going to be what we call the uh, surface temperature of the star. Okay, that's the surface temperature of the star. And that's measured in Kelvin. So what this tells us then is we can actually relate the luminosity and the surface area of a star and its surface temperature. Now why is this useful? I mean this may seem really weird here so maybe I'll spend a little bit of time here going over this one. So how could this be useful? Well, once we know, I think this is actually a really useful one here. So uh, once we know the temperature of the star and we just did that using the Wien's displacement law, right? So knowing the maximum wavelength, we can then know the temperature of the star. And if we know the temperature, uh, then what we can do is we can guess at L. In other words, this tells us something about its luminosity. Remember, I was talking about how difficult it is to know something about L. Um, the reason why we know this is it tells us something about um, the apparent brightness. Remember that the apparent brightness was B equals L over 4 pi D squared, where D is the distance away uh, from it. So um, if you know that, that would actually be really useful. Uh, we also know this, though, that hotter stars, this tells us something, that if 
uh, star is uh, hotter. So if it's T here, so hotter stars are more luminous. All right, so that means that if something is hotter, it actually gives off more light. And that should sort of make sense. And from there then, we could say that uh, if we know the distance to the star, we could say this then. So this one here, uh, what I was doing here when we were guessing at L, this was important because see, in this case right here, if we knew the distance to the star, remember D was the distance from here to the star, B was the apparent brightness which we're measuring, which is easy, and from that, so from distance to the apparent brightness, we can get the luminosity. That's really important. Because then if we can know the distance to the star, and we uh, then know the luminosity of the star, we can then tell something about the radius of the star. So we can then tell the radius of the star. So that's also really cool. So what I mean by that is, okay, let's say you took your measurements of a star, and a star is close enough to where you can actually tell its distance independently. We're going to talk about methods like that, but there's a method called the parallax method, for example. So if we could do that, we could get the distance to the star, and then we could also, well, this is easy to measure. This is the apparent brightness on Earth. From this equation right here, we can get the luminosity. Now the luminosity also is related to the temperature. And of course, looking at the spectrum of it, we can easily tell its temperature because of its peak wavelength, which came from this one. So that means then, knowing its distance, knowing its apparent brightness gets us luminosity. The peak wavelength tells us the temperature. And from that, that means we can sort of, we can solve for A. And solving for A really tells us something about the radius of the star. So R, the radius of the star. That's really important. So from that you can see that we can actually get the radius of the star. So this equation I think is really cool in combination with Wien's displacement law and with the Stefan Boltzmann's law and if you knew something about the distance to the star you can actually tell lots of things. Right? You can tell its temperature, its luminosity, you can tell its radius. So that's really really useful for us.